You see, there are lots of times that, you know, humanly speaking, we have so many care in this life, but we forgot why God saved us and why God allowed us to be here in this world yet. I would like you to turn your Bibles tonight and we will um, study and in the Old Testament, one of the books of the Old Testament and Minor Prophets, Jonah, and uh, turn with me to the book of Jonah. I'll use some uh, powerful, uh, PowerPoint uh, tonight. If you are you know, doing your notes, uh, this can help you as we go along in the book of Jonah. So book, the book of Jonah, and we'll be, uh, I'll be reading verses 1 to 3 of chapter 1. And just follow along with your eyes as I read verses 1 to 3, and then we will go the entire the entirety of the book as we go along. So Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The Word of God says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You know, people today... I try to run from, from God in many ways. Uh, some people try to avoid God or run from God because of accountability. Uh, they don't want the reality of a supreme being who will judge their actions, and so they chose to say that there is no God. Uh, they don't want to be guilty about the way they live. Others avoid God by trying to fill their lives with worldly success, uh, fame, and uh, power. And sadly, sometimes uh, Christians, Christians ignore God or try to run from God because He calls them to do something. But they don't want to do it. That's why they ran from God. So in our story tonight, Jonah ran because he didn't want to do God's will. So tonight we're going to study three scenarios uh, in the life of Jonah and draw some timeless truths that we can hold on, we can hold on to and by God's grace apply them into our lives. And and this is my prayer. It's not just, yes, you agree with the sermon, with, we agree with the timeless truths that we are going to talk about, but when we go out from this building, we will not do something about it. So that's my prayer, that we all go out from this place in something that will hold on to the truths and we will uh, do something about what we have heard. So let's pause for a word, for a word of prayer. And let's commit uh, the, uh, this service to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we can uh, learn from your word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to be here. And Lord, we, I ask that you would just speak into our hearts and uh, help give us, Lord, the receptive heart and spirit. Lord, we, we are nothing without you. And... I pray that as we continue to learn different principles and truths in our lives, that we will continue to grow in our relationship with you. And so, Father, be with us tonight. We commit to you all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, uh, there's three scenarios. Um, I'll ent I entitled, by the way, I entitled the, the preaching tonight, Jonah, yes, yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, 
this. I, uh, this is what I always, this is my problem always. Every time I hold this clicker, it doesn't work. But everyone, if anyone or anyone else except me will hold this, it works. Um, here, oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, so uh, first scenario here is that Jonah ran from God. And we can see that in, in the, our text uh, tonight. Uh, especially, I will read verse 3, if you can follow along with me as, uh, as we continue to go. Verse 3 to 5. Okay, we already know that God commanded Jonah to, to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel there. But verse 3, it says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he went a ship uh, going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go, uh, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Now you can see here, um, we don't have much information about Jonah, but we, if you read Second Kings, and at the same time also in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned him, so I have no problem to you telling about um, his historicity, if he's real or not, but the Bible says that he is real. But um, looking here, uh, Jonah is actually from Gath Hefer. It's actually one of the small towns in the regions of Galilee uh, near Nazareth. And we know the, uh, the town Nazareth, Jesus Christ came there. And uh, the Bible says that Jonah was commanded by God to arise and go to Nineveh, which is the northeast uh, of Israel. And you can see that arrow uh, leads to, to Nineveh. Uh, but Jonah, as the Bible says, went down to Joppa. So there's Joppa there, which is in the southwest of Israel. It's totally opposite direction to what God commanded, them to, to, commanded him to go. To give you a bigger perspective, what, where is Tarshish? So Tarshish is basically, you see there in Spain. Oh, sorry. There you go. Um, see Spain there. Uh, a lot of commentators would say that that's where Tarshish uh, um, it, uh, was. And do you see how very opposite he went to, uh, from the presence, from, from God's will? And my point is this, is that when he ran from God, I have... Uh... Okay, so there. When he ran from God, and my point is this, that running from God is always downhill. It was and will always be. It's always downhill. And you can read a book of Proverbs wherein God also, uh, we, are, we are told that every, everything, that it, the way leads to destruction are always downhill. Uh, God's way is always upward. Okay, and uh, we can see that in our salvation. We will fi first... Uh, dead in our sins and trespasses, but because of God, now we raise from the dead and we are now living in a newness of life because of God, right? We can see that also in our Christian life, God's will for us to grow, but when we stop following God's will and run from God, we became stagnant and not actually grows but the will of god for us in our christian life is to grow in our christian life to grow always we can see that also in our destination we were once lead um leading to to hell because of our sinful nature but because of jesus christ once again we were now heading towards heaven so you can see that uh, the opposite of God's way is always downhill. And we can see that in the life of Jonah. Actually, if, if, uh, 
if you read verse 4 and verse 5, you can see he went down to Joppa, where we, we, we have read. He went down to Joppa, and when he went to the sh ship, he went down into it. And now in verse 5, we can see, we, we hear him, uh, we, we read that not only he went down to the ship, he also went there in the sides of the ship to sleep. And he was fast asleep. And you see how, how dangerous it is if you, we run from God. And Jonah did that. He, uh, being in those, and uh, let me remind you that being those in different ways, or in that situations are not accidents. You are there because of choice. Jonah chose to go his own way, but it, it doesn't end there. If you read once again, verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. You know, Jonah, uh, God commanded Jonah, Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach against their sin. And Jonah, it's kind of like, you know, it ain't going to happen, Lord. And one actor said, I'm going to make this way harder than it needs to be. Well, it did, actually, it did. And my, my second point is there, running from God is always uncomfortable and hard. Uh, this contrasts with, with what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we start running from God, we are actually living a life that is uncomfortable and hard. But when we come closer to God, we're actually feel, feeling, and this burden that we have become, becomes lighter because we're not, we're not carrying it anymore, but it is the Lord Jesus Christ. But I will hasten to say, though, that hardships and discomforts were, uh, in life are not always the result of running away from the Lord. God can use hardships in life to test our faith in Him. But in Jonah's case, we know that these hardships were caused by his disobedience. Disobedience creates turmoil in our lives. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 15, But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you. And it was against your fathers. Many hardships in life can be avoided if we just run towards God. For Jonah, he put himself into a difficult situation by choosing to run from God. But wait, there's a third one in verse 7. Uh, let me read to you verses 7 to 8. And they said everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? And what, what is thou country? And of what people art thou? Fast forward to verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Now God hurled a great storm against the ship. And I believe the, these sailors has the capacity to maneuver or, or on great storms. But the sailors were terrified. Everyone panicked. And meanwhile, jo Jonah, he was there. And the person responsible for the danger lay fast asleep in ships, uh, lower level, as if, you know, nothing happened. And my point is this. Running from God 
always hurts others. Now, many times, many times we kind of think of that when we do sin against God, it only, it only hurt us. You know, it doesn't matter because it's just only me. No, you've probably mistaken that because when we run from God, other people always get involved. Your loved ones, your family, your church, and other people get involved in the situation. And we, when we try to run from God, always, always hurts others. And our sin will always hurt other people but ultimately, God himself. God himself. You know, Adam sinned against God, and it brought sin unto the world. Achan sinned, and his whole family died. David sinned, and his, and his son died, and brought turmoil into his family. Jonah sinned by running from the presence of God, which is impossible to do. And first... In Psalm 139, we read that verse, verses 7 to 10. You don't need to go there. But the Bible says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take my wings in the mornings and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. You see, we cannot escape the presence of the Lord. And if we try to run from the Lord, it's futile. It's impossible. There's a famous saying, you can run, but you can hide from the presence of the Lord. Now, when I, was in, when I was in high school, when I was in my high school years, our pastor taught us many things like preaching, uh, teaching, uh, soul winning, and so on. Uh, seven of us, to be exact, uh, seven guys. And when I went to a university, I tried to, you know, to run from the Lord. And everything went downhill for me. But he was there to remind me, my, my pastor was there to remind me of God's love and his forgiveness. He also reminded me of his famous quotation, uh, uh, famous question that really stuck in my mind in most of, of, of the young people, including, um, including me until this day. I, I cannot forget what he would always say to us, you know, when you run from God, this is his question, to whom or where should you go that is better than the Lord? You always remind that to whom or to where you should go that is better than the Lord. And what do you think is the answer? Nothing. Right? So you see, running from God will never be a good decision in life. But in, interestingly, a lot of Christians try, you know, in, in history. Running from God is really a futile. And this was, I think, what Jonah learned. And so what happened? Now, instead of running from the presence of God, he decided to run with God. He ran with God. Jonah was, was, was uh, you know the story, he was thrown overboard and he was in the water, probably thought that he would drown there, uh, but God's grace prevailed. God's grace prevailed. And the Lord prepared a great fish to, sw to swallow up Jonah. I don't want to deal with... Uh, speculations and criticisms of others. Um, but the fish was a miraculous touch of God's grace upon his life. Okay, but in chapter 2, we see Jonah prayed to God. And I believe while in the belly of the fish, he acknowledged his sin and asked for forgiveness. The backslider is now willing to do God's will. 
Jonah renounces his sin, remembers his vow and service, consecrated his life to God, and ends his prayer with five words. And you can see that, actually, in chapter 2, verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, 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 that I have vowed. Here, here it is, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. You know, running with God, and this is my point here, running with God, it always involves obedience. You know, um, John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And I think that's what happened to Jonah here. He is now, from running away from God, he is now willing to commit. He reconsecrated his life, and now you can see him running with God, but it involves obedience because he didn't obey yet in this, in this time the command of God, correct? So the fish vomited Jonah onto the shore, and we, re, uh, we read here in chapter 3, Verses 1 to 4, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach, un and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city, to, us, to the city, a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. When he arrived in Nineveh, he began preaching the message that God had given him. You know, Jonah needed three days, the Bible says, to cover the great city completely. And when he preaching, but we know what happened, right? The whole city repented, and there was a great revival in the city. Uh, and, and this is my point here. Now, despite of your past, right, and weaknesses, God can still use you to bring about His will. A lot of people, when they ran from God and they know they messed up in their lives, they're now trying to, you know, be in the situation we're in. You know, I will, God will never forgive me. God will, you know, will never use me. But here we can see in, in, in Jonah's life, and despite of his past and weaknesses, God still used him to bring about his will. Now, this is, um, and we, we go into the Bible also, and we can see if you're willing. God always uses people who are willing, who are willing to, to do his will. So he, Jonah, now we see Jonah ran, ran with God, and this we will go into the third scenario we're in. He, Jonah, ran to God. Now in verse 3, chapter 10, we're, we're here now in, in, in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, sorry. And then I will read from chapter 4 to 3 as well. Now in verse 10 of chapter 3, And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said, that he would do unto them, and he did, and he did it not. Now look, uh, now here in chapter 4, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, 
for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, Jonah obeyed, right? He was willing. He actually uh, ran with God. But why did he pout over Nineveh? It's supposed to be rejoicing. But instead, he, run, he ran to God, he ran to God and complained about his decision, about God's decision of not destroying the people of the city. Now, we kind of understand him because Jonah knew these people. And though he preached God's judgment, Jonah conveyed no hope of deliverance to these people. He was anticipating Nineveh's destruction, and he was probably shocked when he saw the people repenting. And you see, uh, this is my point, this third point. Uh, it is the Word of God that changes lives. We have always remembered that. It is not us. Okay? It is not us. It is God who changed the lives of people, His Word, right? And it is not us. And so that's what uh, we, we always uh, need to keep reminded of ourselves. And we sometimes are so focused with ourselves and forget that we have a powerful message. We have a powerful message. But I want you to see, in my last point here, because I believe the last truth that we're going to learn this night the true, last truth and principle is the overall like, thrust, thrust in the book of Jonah. And rem- you know, remember, you know, he, remember he was sitting outside, right? He was sitting outside um, the city. Um, actually, he's there. He was sitting outside the city and waiting for Nineveh's destruction. Well, God spared the city. And he was so upset that the people repented. Then God provided a, uh, you know, a plant. Uh, the Bible says it's a gourd uh, to provide shade for him. He was exceedingly glad with this gourd. But then God prepared a, a worm and smote the gourd that it withered. Not only that, but God also prepared a vehement wind and the sun to be to beat upon his head that he fainted and said it is better for me to die than to live you know jonah became angry to the point of death over mere plant but didn't care at all for the hundreds of thousands of people in nineveh And this is my point. That there are many Christians who care for many things in this life, but don't have the time to care for the souls of others. And so this is, I think, the thrust of the message of the book of Jonah You know, no involvement in the Great Commission's uh, Great Commission at all. Even just praying, faith, promise, soul winning. You know, it, you know, we care. A lot of people care about our the the finances, but God already promised that He will provide, isn't it? We sometimes care about our safety and well-being, but God already promised that He is our shield, our refuge, and will always be there for us. That's His promise. We sometimes care about our food to eat and clothes to wear, but God already promised that He is always our Heavenly Father who takes care of us. You see, there are lots of times that You know, humanly speaking, we have so many care in this life, but we forgot why God saved us and why God allowed us to be here in this world yet. You know, to pray for more laborers in the harvest field, 
to get involved in missions giving, to go out in our city, our Jerusalem, to do flyering and soul winning, and to be, be, just be involved of this great commission. And that's what, God wa- uh, God, uh, that's what Jonah learned here. And, and I believe that that's the message that God wanted Jonah to, to learn. And you see, we care so many things in this life, in this world, but we forget to take care of the lost souls of many. You, you know, we need to be compassionate with the lost. And just to think of our salvation, do, do we realize that the reason we got saved is because someone allowed God's compassion, a compassionate heart to rule over, over their hearts? Someone was willing to do by, uh, to, to, to be used by God and share the gospel to you. Someone shared the gospel to you. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we kind of reminded with, with ourselves. And how can we l- let God be, you know, be use our lives? And I think it starts by letting the master hold the key unto your life. You know, we read Romans chapter 12, verse 1, And I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Right? We need to be, you know, to give our lives to him, that he is in control of our lives. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it said, uh, Paul mentioned that, Is it not him already that's living? It is Christ living in him, you know, that God wants to live a life that he is, uh, that he is the one now controlling in our lives. And may our prayer be, Lord, here is my life. Lord, here is my life. Use it as you see fit. Now, I will end this. Uh, this message in the story. Now, years ago, an old, er, uh, elderly church organist sat on his bench you know, and played for the last time. And he, he was a good organist and had uh, served his church faithfully and well over the past several years. But a new organist had moved to town. And the early, uh, elderly man wanted to step aside with dignity. Though he knew he'd miss playing each Sunday, he was excited to be blessed by the new young man and of the gift of music he would give to the congregation. The er elderly man struck the last chord, closed the organ, locked it, and carried the key to the back of the church. And in the foyer, the young organist was waiting for him anxiously. He asked for the key. And then he literally ran through the aisles in the sanctuary to get to the organ. He excitedly unlocked and opened a great instrument and began to play. Though the old organist had played each note with precision, this new musician played with more intensity, more depth, and more passion. His music brought tears to the elderly man's eyes as he stood in the back of the sanctuary, watching the young man's hands glide gracefully over the keys. Within just a few months, the new organist's reputation spread. And people began coming to church from miles around just to hear him play. The new organist was definitely a master of his craft. It, it was obviously he had more skill than anyone in that area had ever heard. And the young man's name, Johann Sebastian Bach. 
As the elderly man left the sanctuary one day, he thought to himself, My, what a shame if I had never given him the key. Now, folks, in our lives, Jesus Christ is the key. What if we fail to give the key to that young man? Uh, uh, you know, we, we, for we fail to give the key, Jesus Christ, to, to a young man that is unsaved or a young woman that is unsaved. And perhaps we gave them the key. If we gave them the key, they would become a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist or a great Christian worker. I will, and I will end this, that may we continue to be a servant of the Lord who is willing to do His great commission. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word. Thank you.